Introductions. Uh, first up, I'm going to introduce uh, Bryant McBride. Bryant is the CEO and founder of Burst.com, which is a media content platform. He's also the co-founder of the Carnegie Initiative for Inclusion and Acceptance in Hockey, NHL's first black executive, and the co-producer of Willie, the movie, which actually is going to be screened here uh, at the Container Village on Tuesday. So, Bryant, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here, really great to be here. Next up, we've got Tampa Bay Lightning draft pick, made his NHL debut in April of this year for the Arizona Coyotes. President Cup champion, Sea Dogs alumni, please welcome Boko Imama. Boko's biggest fan, we've introduced up next, we've got uh, another Tampa Bay draft pick, back-to-back -back Stanley Cup champion with the Tampa Bay Lightning. <laughs> Current member of the Ottawa Senators, President Cup champion, St. John Sea Dogs alumni member, Matthew Joseph. I gotta admit, I'm just happy that the boys are here today. So I think they've had a good time in St. John. Maybe guys starting off, uh, what's it like to be back in St. John? You wanna start by there? <laughs> I guess I'll go. I know, it's just so great to be back. Maybe it's bringing uh, so much memories uh, playing here, having the chance to see uh, so many familiar faces, uh, old teammates. Uh, my St. John family is sitting right here too. It's great to see them. So overall, everything has been great. Yeah, it's been fun, and honestly, uh, you know, came back once um, a couple years ago, obviously see my billet, and spent a little bit of time. We got our rings here, and for that uh, Uberto's ceremony, and, you know, it's always fun to be back where uh, we started as kids, and we left as adults, you know, so um, City that has welcomed us so well since we've been here, and um, always fun to see, uh, see the boys that, you know, we had so many good memories with, so uh, it's been fun so far. Brian, welcome to you to St. John as well. I, mean, I think you said you were here one other time. The weather was exactly like it is today, I think you were saying. Absolutely. I, uh, I said when I was packing, I'm going to St. John. I don't have to bring shorts. And, you know, here, here we are. Now, it's such a beautiful city. Um, you know, I, I've been to one Memorial Cup in my hometown in Sault Ste. Marie uh, a long time ago. And uh, you guys, I must say, I love my hometown, but you guys have surpassed it. It's uh, very spectacular what you guys have done. Congratulations. Brian, maybe, uh, maybe just a little bit about what you're doing now. Um, I mentioned the organization that you work with. Um, uh, maybe talk a little bit about what's, what's happening with you right now, and then we'll get into maybe your, your sure, background. Sure, history. yeah. Um, well, to provide a tiny bit of context, um, um, you know, as, as Mark said, I was the first black employee at the National Hockey League in 19, dating myself, 1993, a long time ago. So I was Gary Bettman's seventh hire, and um, there wasn't a diversity effort. And I found myself at the NHL, having um, grown up playing hockey my whole life, I said, I'm here, I have to do something. So one of the first things that I did was um, I set out to find Willie O'Ree. And Willie wasn't on anyone's radar, he'd kind of been forgotten about. Um, most of the time that I've spent in New Brunswick has been in Fredericton, right? Visiting Willie and family and friends, his family and friends there. So, um, you know, when I, when I met Willie, he was living in San Diego, everyone had forgotten about him. And um, he, was, he was working in security at a hotel and, you know, feeding his family, proud guy. Many of you probably know him. He's just an exceptional guy. And, and I, one of the things that struck me from that meeting was I went into his office and there's the Order of Canada. I was like, wow, that's, you know, they don't give those out. Just it's the highest civilian honor given to a Canadian citizen. And right next to it were two plaques where Willie was employee of the year at the hotel he was working at. All work matters. It's humble, gracious, earnest. He's from New Brunswick, right? So he, that's just kind of who he is. And, it, and it, was, it was awesome to see and notice. And um, so from that to watching Willie's jersey go up to the rafters in the Boston Garden last July, last, um, these five days are really important. On Tuesday, watching Willie's jersey get lifted into the rafters of the Boston Garden, that was 26 years worth of work, 
you know, Willie and I and, and, a whole, and a lot of other people. I don't take the credit. There's so many people. So I cried like a baby when I watched that. It was really emotional. And then on the Tuesday, Willie became the um, only person alive to win the, the Order of Canada and to, be, and to get the Congressional Gold Medal as the highest civilian honor in the United States. There's nobody else who's ever done it. Willie O'Ree's the only person, you know, which is incredible. So prior to that, you probably, you may have heard the name Herb Carnegie. Herb was before Willie. Herb played in the, um, played in the 40s uh, for the Quebec Aces, highest league under the NHL, on an all-black line that included his brother and a guy named Manny McIntyre. And um, he, he was... He was an exceptional player, and he, he tried out for the Leafs, and he was told, this is crazy, I'm just going to you know, be really direct and throw it out there. He was told by Con Smythe, who they're going to give out that trophy in the next few days, he was told by Con Smythe that um, he, would, he would pay anyone $10,000 to paint him white. Herb never played a game in the NHL. How he responded to that, 1955, the same month, that Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat in Montgomery, Alabama. He started the first hockey school for white, black, and indigenous kids to play together, and he did that for six decades. That's what he did, right? So, sorry to be so long-winded, but I think it's an important context. So we started something about two years ago called the Carnegie Initiative in Hockey. It's all about inclusion in hockey. Myself and his daughter, Bernice Carnegie, are the co-chairs and there's people like Grant Fuhr and uh, Sarah Nurse and um, just, you know, Willie O'Ree and Angela James. Uh, they're all on, Ted Nolan, they're, they're on this committee. And we work relentlessly to provide opportunities that are, that are thoughtful enough and sophisticated enough to fight some of the systemic things that exist in hockey. And really, hockey's just a microcosm at large. I live in Boston, so it, it's a fight right now. It's a real fight right now. And we are... Um, we're sharpening our, our, uh, our, our sticks and our blades, and uh, we're going at it. So we're going to do everything we can so that, you know, there are hundreds of players as good as these guys in the future. Foco and Matthew, I'd love to talk a little bit about your hockey career. Um, maybe we can start about just early days. How did you get involved in the sport? Um, where did you play hockey? What was the introduction to hockey like for you? Um, well, my dad played hockey a little bit. I uh, started figure skating when I was two or three years old. Uh, I was all cute in my little, <laughs> in my little outfit there for a couple of years. Um, but no, I love figure skating. Lo obviously, loved the very um, hyper kids, so I needed to move it a lot. And uh, played a lot of sports, but you know, played soccer a long time. Um, played hockey. When I, was, I started hockey when I was six years old. I lo loved doing it because of my dad. And um, I don't know, I just uh, started to be really passionate about it. And uh, obviously I was always watching him play. He watched the Montreal Canadian growing up too. And um, after that, I was just, you know, kept working hard and just loved to be on the ice all the time. So, um, so I started to be passionate about the game. And, um, you know, my brother was involved after this when he started to play hockey as well. And, um, you know, after this, just end up uh, working out. <clears throat> Sorry, and uh, me, just a little bit like Matthew, uh, I did many sports uh, uh, growing up. I played uh, basketball, football, soccer, baseball, and obviously if you're a kid who grew up in Montreal, hockey is going to be a part of the sports that uh, you practice, and uh, obviously the nature of hockey, that physicality, that competitiveness, it just got me hooked to it, and uh, yeah, I guess I'm still doing it today. Matthew, you referred... Now, though. <laughs> Love it. You referred to your, your family, some of your family. Uh, you mentioned your brother plays the game, of course, and your dad was a coaching. How big of an influence was your family on you as a kid and grow, growing up in the sport and getting involved? Yeah, like I said, I was a pretty hyper kid, still pretty hyper nowadays. <laughs> um, but honestly, uh, I needed to move, you know, and, um, you know, sports really helped me, you know, calm down and um, put my mind into things. And, uh, you know, my... My parents all, always wanted me to, you know, give everything I had at anything I did. And hockey was the same thing, you know. And uh, so, you know, for me, it was easy to go to the rink or to go work out. My, they never really pushed me to, you know, 
try to become a hockey player growing up. It was more, hey, you, you like that? Are you passionate about it? If you want to be passionate about it, just do it 100%. And, and that's really what I did. And, um, you know, they, they had a huge influence on me, not be, because uh, of the way they were pushing me. Obviously, they wanted me to do well, but uh, it's also because they wanted me to perform and also, you know, learn values that you learn when you, ha when you play hockey. And, uh, you know, being in a group and uh, leadership, some values like this. And, um, you know, obviously, have being with a group of people, you know, you have to share responsibilities in a team, roles. Uh, you have to be strong mentally, uh, character, you know, competitive. And, you know, that's all things that you use in hockey that you also use a lot in life. And, uh, you know, hockey wasn't just a sport for me. It was also a big life, le life lessons that I was, you know, learning through hockey. And, um, you know, I got to thank my parents for that. So that's a lot of influence on that. Um, Maddie pretty much uh, said it all. I think uh, all of us as hockey players, that's pretty much uh, how we feel, how we're coming from. And, you know, I think we all have the, you know, the support for, for our parents. But, you know, growing up with four sisters, I just wanted to be out of the home and, you know, do some sport, be with the boys and, you know, just be competitive. So. He's, a, he's in the middle of four sisters, which is crazy to me because I would have I been gone when I was like, well, 10 years old. <laughs> That's why I'm gone now. <laughs> At what point was it that you knew that you were good enough to make a career of this? Is, was, there a, was there a clear point along the way? Was it a gradual progression? Or was there a moment that you're like, you know what, I can actually do this, and I can make it to the show, and I, this, can be my, this can be my career? Well, personally, not really. I didn't really watch a major junior hockey game until I was probably 15. So I didn't really know how it works to play in the NHL or whatever. I was uh, very focused on school. My parents were very big about it. Um, if I wasn't doing well in school, then I wouldn't play hockey. So I had to, to, to perform well in, in school. And, uh, you know, when I played in St. John, my first two years were okay. Not bad, but okay. And, uh, you know, I just got drafted that second year. And um, after that, you know, I just, like I said earlier, I kind of kept working and ended up working out. But I didn't really have a plan of, you know, one day I'm just going to play in the NHL. It was more of a dream, to be honest. And, um, you know, like I said, I just worked really hard at it, and I was passionate about it, and ended up working out. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I always knew I wanted to be a professional athlete. I didn't really know if it was going to be in hockey at first, but uh, I feel like as a young kid, I always see myself as, the, you know, that person. And, uh, yeah, when I got drafted uh, in the QMJHL for the Big Homo Drakkar, that is when, uh, you know, I started to, you know, take uh, my career way more seriously. And uh, everything just become uh, hockey, hockey. Uh, not so much school, but, <laughs> but yeah. Hey, if, I, if I can, real quick, uh, I'm going to answer it the other way. Because I didn't, I didn't play in the NHL. I, I made it in the front office. But I knew, I played growing up, you know, in Sault Ste. Marie. And I knew I was not going to make the NHL when I played against Ron Francis. <laughs> <laughs> I do right away. I was like, oh my God, this guy, he was, uh, he was exceptional. You know, he's the fourth leading scorer of all time. And uh, I got to see it up close. I had a really good seat to watch and Ronnie do his thing. But in the NHL, um, making it to, you know, the front office, um, you know, I was lucky enough to go to good schools. But, but I, knew that, um, I knew that there was a, an opportunity to, to add something to the league and that the league was open to growing after I met... Um, um, Gary Batman and Brian Burke. That, they made it clear that they wanted to expand the game and make it for, for everyone. I want to maybe talk to the, about a little bit about how you arrived in St. John. You both arrived different ways. Um, Boko, you came here via trade. You were here. That's a pretty good story, too, actually. <laughs> you know, why don't you tell us the story about how you arrived in St. John? So, uh, uh, it is a pretty crazy story, actually. Uh, I got traded uh, from Bay Como to St. John. It was Christmas time. And uh, everyone who has been in Bay Como is, uh, I've never seen so much snow in a place like this. <laughs> so uh, my plan was to uh, drive down. I had a road trip, eight hour road trip. I didn't really go as planned, crashed my car. Uh, <laughs> had to take a flight the next day. I got in St. John. I think I landed in St. John at 7.05. Uh, the game was supposed to start at 7.00. Yeah, I just crashed, right? So in my mind, there's no chance in hell I'm playing that game that <laughs> night. And uh, the GM at the time was uh, Daryl Young. 
He just came to grab me at the airport and was like, yeah, well, you're going to play tonight. And I was sitting in his car. It was probably 7.15. Game started at 7. So I'm like, oh, my goodness. I get to the rink. Uh, first guy I, I, I saw from the St. John Sea Dogs, it was uh, Mr. Right here, Matthew Joseph. I think he was suspended or injured. I was doing your job. I was suspended. <laughs> <laughs> so he was suspended, right? So that's why they got me in, because we can't have him suspended. And uh, I remember he had to uh, tape my hockey stick for me. I got in in the second period and I uh, finished the game with uh, two assists. So I was, I was like, <laughs> thank you, Maddie. I was like, who, who the he thinks he is? I'm taping a stick. What's up, man? Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, but for myself, uh, you know, I got drafted here my first year. I remember coming on with big hair, huge hair. I had a massive fro, and uh, you know, I didn't know what to expect. Really, didn't really speak English. Knew pretty much only the bad words. And, um, you know, I got to learn English, uh, you know, learn the people in St. John a little bit and uh, had a couple of different billets because of the little things that happened. But, um, you know, it was, uh, for me coming in at 16 was, uh, was life changing, obviously. Uh, I got to learn English, was, which was huge for me. Uh, you know, I'm really happy I got to spend a lot of time in an English, English environment like this. Uh, my English still isn't that great, but it's still better than what it would have been. So, um, you know, I think for me, it was, like I said, it was, it was huge for me to come here and being able to learn English, learn, to, learn, learn that, that language. And, um, you know, I didn't make the team at 16, but at Christmas I came in and, um, you know, always, uh, it was always a good time. Brian, you mentioned you entered uh, hockey a different way than playing the game like these guys did. Um, how did it work out that you ended up at the National Hockey League? And you mentioned you mentioned you worked did a little bit of work with Kim Davis and the team that are there today. What was your entry into? Yeah, um, it was more. I wanted to work in. I wanted to work in sports, and um, I was living in Detroit, working for a real estate firm, and um, I wasn't enjoying working in real estate at all. Wanted to figure out. Wanted to figure out how to get into sports, and was playing pickup hockey with a bunch of guys. One of which worked for the Detroit Tigers. And the Tigers were owned by the Red Wings, and uh, the Red Wings and the Tigers were owned by the Illich family, Mike Illich and uh, you know his Marion Illich, and and so um, you know I talked to him, and through the Illiches they introduced me to Gary Bettman and to Steve Solomon, and um, went to New York, and and you know Gary was literally a month and a half, two months into his tenure, long time ago, um, and interviewed with them, and. Um, just really felt strongly that um, there was an opportunity to grow the game in non-traditional ways, right? To, um, to expose the sport to kids that, um, that, uh, that just, you know, traditionally hadn't gotten a chance to play. And, you know, the work that we started doing with Willie really early, early on, we knew that it had the chance to have generational impact, right? And so we planted those seeds a long time ago, and some of those seeds are now these guys and lots of other great players. When I got there, there were three, three black players in the NHL. Um, there's now over 40, and that number's growing. But it's taken 30 years, right? So how do we do 10x in 10 years? That's really what we're after. As the face of Canada and the United States, the United States is changing. You know, the, in Canada right now, the the um, demographic rule is frankly, that um, the majority of people in Canada are visible minorities. And to the panel that was earlier, if they don't feel welcome in this game, then we got a big problem. That doesn't happen, that switch doesn't flip in the United States until, the, until early 2040s, but it's coming. And you can feel it in the politics, you can feel it in the polarization, you know, that is changing so dramatically because of the demographics. So making the sport available and accessible you know, Ken, Ken Dryden, his brilliant book, The Game, which many of you have read, you know, if you, I read it again after 30 years recently, and he talks about, you know, relig hockey being religion and the rink being, you know, the sanctum and the church and the cathedral of the game. If somebody wearing, a, you know, a hijab or, you know, or, or just looking differently in a rink doesn't feel welcome, then we got a big problem. Right? That's a barrier of entry that is hard to climb for people who we have to bring into the sport if the game is going to continue to reach the heights that you know, we all hope it does. Brian, you mentioned uh, Willie O'Ree. Of course, everybody in New Brunswick knows Willie and everybody in hockey knows what a pioneer he was. Um, 
maybe to the guys, was there anybody that you looked up to in the game that was kind of your inspiration or who you idolized as kids growing up? I think uh, we both have uh, the, the same player, me and Matty. Uh, it was for us, it was Jerome McGinley, a uh, great player. Yeah. I'm not sure if he played in for the St. John's Flames, did he? No, I don't think so. No? Okay. Well, anyways, you know, he was a player that I looked up to. Same skin scholar. He was a great leader. And, you know, he did it for many, many years, you know, for, for Calgary. So, you know, for me, that was kind of like uh, just uh, someone to look at and to follow. Yeah, he's, you know, you can see uh, that he's a great person, too. Uh, he's a captain of... He's been captain for, he was a captain forever. Uh, obviously, he's been well respected around the league. Um, you know, would stick up for his teammate, but also would score goals and play gritty. And, you know, was doing pretty much everything you want to do, you want a player to do on the ice. And, uh, you know, to have a player that looks like you, you know, color wise, and um, to be that good of an influence around, around the league and so well respected was a great role model for me. Actually, my favorite player growing up was Grant Fuhr. And uh, you know, I've read his book and heard a lot of his stories. And he was talking about um, you know, how important it was to have people that he looked up to because they, he, they'd kind of gone before him and had, had kind of blazed that trail for him. And you guys just mentioned Jerome McGinley. Do you guys feel any obligation or, or sense of pride, perhaps, maybe a different word, that you're doing the same thing for kids coming behind you these days? Absolutely. Um... You know, sometimes we don't really realize the impact we have on other kids. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to take a little bit of time in my day as much as I can to have an impact on, if I can have one, an impact on one kid, then, you know, my, my job is done, you know? Like, I, I, I've, I've, I've helped the kid and I've, I've done his day for a picture or anything. And, um, you know, obviously I want to show this on the ice by how I play and how competitive I get and, um, you know, how, how well I want to help the team to win, but also, I think I try to take a lot of my time uh, when I'm not on the ice to, you know, obviously talk to kids and have an impact in their future. And uh, sometimes, like I said, I don't know how much an impact I have until sometimes they tell me or that I see it. But, um, you know, every time that I, that, I, that I put my skates on and I put my jersey on, and whoever, whoever team I'm playing with, uh, and, you know, I want to be a good role model for next generations and for the, for the kids that, you know, are coming up and, are passionate or as passionate or more passionate even than me uh, that plays that plays this game so um you know obviously it's it's, it's huge for me same uh I don't, there's never going to be i'm never going to do my career without uh you know giving back to uh the the younger generation that's always something that's gonna that's gonna stick with me whether it's after a game or for any type of events and any type of kids too sometimes there are kids that are not even in hockey they're just just in general life, they will look up to you. So, and being in that position, obviously, uh, I'm honored for sure to be in that position. And it just, that's what keeps me motivated day in, day out to, to work harder. If I, if I can tell a quick story about Boko real quick. I mentioned Willie getting, um, getting um, the, um, getting so his jersey too. retired. Uh, getting his jersey retired. Getting um, uh, the, the Congressional Gold Medal. That was on a Tuesday, he got his jersey retired. On a Wednesday, the Congressional Gold Medal. On Saturday, Boko gets racially harassed in a game. Jordan Subban, the next day. All in five days. So what we did, we said, okay, that's crazy. We gotta do something. So we worked with partners in New York City in Central Park, and we said, okay, how do, you, how do you respond to black hate with black joy and black excellence? So we call Boko and, and Jordan, and, and um, Boko's in Phoenix. He gets on a plane and flies to New York City. We have a conference there where we, we worked with our friends at Turner Sports and the NHL and Geico, and we did this press conference and this event over the next month that got 100 million impressions. We did a story on Willie and Herb and Boko was in it, and we reached, you know, millions of people. That's how to, that's how to influence people and fight back. So, you know, it's coming. If we think back over the last, um, last couple of years, Brian, you alluded to, uh, you know, some things going on in the world that 
are a bit uncomfortable and things you probably need to address. And Boko, you were quite public about, um, you know, coming out about an incident that happened to you where there was, uh, you know, a gesture that was made on the ice. And you, you mentioned that how disappointing I think it was. What, what was the emotion going through that? And it, it, was, it, was it frustrating that we're still dealing with this stuff in today's day and age? And, and kind of how, I, I can't imagine that experience and I can't relate to that, but what was it that you were working through in that process and, and what was kind of the emotion that you were experiencing? Uh, <clears throat> uh, emotions, I, I don't think I could put uh, emotions into words. It's, uh, it's a really odd situation. If, uh, if anyone has to go through it. But uh, it's just so, just so much confusion because uh, the game of hockey has been great to me, you know. Uh, there's so many times that you think that uh, the game has progressed, has moved forward, but then when something like this uh, happened, you just feel like you took uh, two step backs or like you didn't even took a step forward. So it's just a whole lot of uh, confusion. Uh, it was a tough stretch uh, for me because in the moment when things like this happen, you're alone. I don't care if you have teammates, uh, family, friends. When it happens on the ice, you're alone. But uh, you know, I was able to recover from because of of all the support of everyone, people from St. John, people from wherever I was playing, friends, family. I knew throughout the process I was not that alone. But uh, you know, it's just one of those things that I just don't wish on anyone. You know, if, if, if I can, the I once heard it described best by, by, you know, I think you guys know Simmer, right? You guys know Wayne Simmons? Yeah. You guys know Wayne, right? So Wayne Simmons, you know, veteran guy with the Leafs now, has been around the league like Jerome McGinley, a really respected guy. When Wayne talks, everyone listens kind of guy, right? In the room, that's why he's on the Leafs um, and, and other reasons. But he, he once described it so perfectly. I'd never heard it described, you know, about racial incidents on the ice. He said... Um, you know, the joy of hockey from the time you're a little kid all the way through is you're, you're, you're present. You're there, right? And, and you are immersed in this bubble of joy of flying down the ice and the wind and, you know, going through and you're scoring goals and you're making passes and making plays. And you are just, it's, it's so, it's heaven. For everyone that's played the game or watched the game, you know what I'm talking about, right? And you're, you can leave everything else behind. When something like that happens on the ice, it pierces that bubble. It's theft. Someone's stealing that joy from you. That's what it, that, that was the best description I've ever heard, right? So when people like yourselves respond, the allies that responded, and a whole bunch of people to what happened to Boko, and I'm sure it's happened to Matt a bunch of times, it's happened to me, it's happened to every black hockey player. It has, it just has, Girl, you know, Girls, boys, doesn't matter. It's happened. It's theft. So understanding that as allies and saying stop stealing from these kids and stop stealing from the game, that's, that's the most important thing. Matthew, I, I believe you were actually helped design a mask uh, for one of the goalies that you kind of... Um, honored your history and, and shone a spotlight on Black Lives Matter and that type of thing. What, what did that mean to you? And maybe describe that process a little bit. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was great for me to do this with my um, backup goalie, um, Curtis McElhinney. Someone who was really, you know, we were really close, a little much more older than me, probably twi almost twice my age, but um, great guy. And, uh, you know, he's not very vocal all the time, but he wanted to do something after George Floyd. Uh, it was something, obviously, we all know what happened there, and uh, he wanted to show his support uh, without necessarily putting it on social media or anything, or putting it in words. And um, so he came up to me and had an idea of, um, you know, making a goalie mask and, and to, you know, to support, obviously, a Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And, um, you know, he gave me pretty much green light to do anything I wanted on it. Uh, you know, I designed it uh, by myself, kind of looked a little bit of what I wanted to put in there. A couple black athletes for me that were uh, very important, I think, for um, generations of, of kids, of, uh, of people. You know, uh, Muhammad Ali was there. I, I, there was an MLK quote on the, on the mask, a Black Lives Matter um, logo. And uh, like I said, it, was a, it was a, took, took a couple weeks, but it was, um, it was, he was honored for it, to, do the, to do this and to wear it. But I was more honored that he even thought about some, doing something like this. And um, 
it just it, for me it just showed how much my teammates care about me in other ways and uh, you know we got to we, we got to put in auction and stuff and you know support obviously the, the movement and um, overall great I had a great time doing it and you know he, he was he was kind enough to let me do this and um, on 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 times that were you know hard for for a community for for people and um, yeah it meant a lot what would you say to people in the crowd, people that look like me, what is it that we should be mindful of and what, what is it that we can be doing to support you guys more or support um, just racial equality and be, just being more mindful of things uh, as, we, as we kind of go through life? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I talk about this stuff, you guys probably can tell, I talk about this stuff a lot and, um, and it's front and center in my world is to you know, make hockey more inclusive. So there's one book I say there's about 10 books you can read. And the, the, the big answer is just spend the time, do some work, right? Understand, it's really about empathy, right? How you would want to be treated, how you'd want your kids to be treated. There's one book in particular though, and it's really interesting. It's called The Racial Healing Handbook. It's about 150 pages. It's really short. It's like a high school like workbook. And it asks questions that make you, whether you're black or, or indigenous, First Nations or, or white, doesn't matter. It makes you think about race differently. It was written by a woman in Georgia who's in a school administrator, and it's the one resource. If you're going to only do one thing in this realm, read this book. It's called The Racial Healing Handbook, and it'll just, light bulbs will be going off in your head, and it'll help you be, it'll help you understand, okay? It's also important to understand the history, right? The history both in Canada and in the U.S. Um, there's been so much forgotten history so much forgotten history that people just don't know the stories. The whole world just discovered Tulsa. You saw Tulsa, the you know, Black Wall Street and everything of a year ago. That wasn't talked about for about 100 years. Incredible, right? Because those stories weren't centered. There's one story, quick story that I'll tell you that, that people need to know these stories because they're stories of aspiration, of overcoming all kinds of difficulties. There was, anyone know who Julius Rosenwald was? by chance? Okay, not, not many people do. He was the Jeff Bezos of his day, white guy, white Jewish guy. In the 1880s, he went to New York and he bumped into a guy named Richard Sears. They built Sears Robux together. Made a gazillion dollars. He got together with a guy named Booker T. Washington from Tuskegee Institute in 1910 to 1954. This is crazy. From 1910 to 1954, they built 5,000 schools and taught black America how to read. Like, who knew, right? I didn't know that until about six months ago. I went to good schools and all that. That's what they did. They increased the black literacy rate by four times in four decades. Maya Angelou, John Lewis, and, and the way they did it, they only gave matching funds. They gave matching funds so that they made the black community pull together and repair the destruction of slavery, of ripping families apart. That's what they did on purpose. And the last thing that he did, he died in 1932. When he, uh, he, 22 years later, in 1954, his estate paid for Brown versus Board of Education to change the law, the, the segregation laws. And no one knows who he is. So we have to tell those stories. So dig in, learn the history. It'll change the way you think about everything. Yeah, I think uh, I think you said it well too. Um, I think education is huge in that in that situation. You know, I think if you're curious about something, obviously you want to understand people, but also you know that that's going to help us. It's going to help other uh, generation after us. It's going to help you guys to understand as well. And uh, I think you know the way you can change all the racism or you know. What happens still in the world is is to educate the children. If you change that mentality over the years, it's not going to obviously come in the next year or two. But if the kids grow with a different mentality, maybe than than, than in the past um, the past you know centuries, then um, you know that's how we're going to change the mind of people, and that's how you can you know move forward. And and you know I think when the mentality is going to be changed, then that's where it's going to there's going to be a huge impact on her. On a race, if you can say it like this, yeah. Uh, I really like both answers from uh, Brent and, and Maddie.
But uh, if there's just one thing I could add is uh, it's also like accountability uh, within us, you know? It doesn't take a black guy to tell to a white people, hey, that, that, was, that was not okay, you can't do that. It's, it's everyone between us, you know? If, uh, if a white people is being disrespectful towards a black people, the white people next to it should be able to stand up and tell that person that, uh, you know, it was not okay. So I think it's uh, accountability within us too. So that was just the point well, I wanted well to add. Well said, well said. Guys, maybe, uh, maybe my last question, then if you're okay, maybe take up a couple from the crowd. But um, one of my good friends is here and his son is here. Uh, also a hockey player. Um, love for you guys to meet them after if you get a moment. But what would you say to uh, young black kids coming up in the event that they faced some of the same challenges that you had? How, how would you encourage them in that moment? What would you suggest they do? What, what advice would you have for any of the kids? Honestly, um, you know, obviously things happen to us. And uh, over the years, it's, uh, sometimes it's a bit much. And I, because of accumulations and for me, through young, younger generations, for them to say, probably tell them the same thing my parents told me, you know, they told me that you're going to hear people say anything anywhere about you, uh, that you're not going to be able to do it in anything. It can be, it doesn't have to be only sports, it can be in school and, um, you know, I'm just going to tell them that, you know, those, those, those comments obviously stand up for yourself, but also, you know, it's, it, it, it's going to build your character. Adversity is good sometimes, you know. Obviously, it doesn't have to go through it all the time, but it's going to build your character. So when times are hard, that's why I would say to the new younger generation, when times are hard, work harder, dig, dig harder. I think in, 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 in our situation, too, in our shoes, obviously, you know, having to, having to deal with things like this, you know, you have to even do it more, and you have to be stronger mentally about that. And... Um, you know, I, I got to learn over the years to brush those comments. It, was, it wasn't always easy. It's not going to be easy all the time. But, um, you know, because of how you grow and as a person and um, how, how, how big your character gets at the end of it, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a good thing if, you, if you're able to be strong mentally and dig harder. So, um, you know, that's what I would tell the younger generation. I have nothing to add. He said it. I, I would... I would only add, I would only add one thing, and it goes back to the Wayne Simmons, to, to you know, to young black players or indigenous players. Don't let anyone steal from you. Only you can allow them to steal from you, right? Unless if you say, you know what, you know, I'm not. That is what it is. That's their issue. That it's going to sting. It's going to hurt. But eyes on the prize, right? Don't let them distract. I'm sure you guys had a million distractions on your path to the show, but you didn't let anyone distract. You know, Boko, what happened you know, to him happened. Four, three months later, he's in the NHL making his debut, right? That's the resilience. When I first called um, his general manager to ask him if we could do this, he went on for half an hour about what an unbelievable guy he is and what character person he is and how important to the organization. You know, I don't know if you, I think I told you that. I don't know if you don't. But, you know, they, they knew that his fortitude under the hardest of paths often, you know, playing in a game that's, that's um, you know, predominantly white can be hard, but it has shaped these guys in a way that they, you know, you, you need, you know, you're watching it on TV every night now or every other night. You, you need people with incredible intestinal fortitude to win at that level, right? These guys have extra just because, right? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, guys. I appreciate the time. Um, maybe we'll take two, two questions from the audience if you guys are up for it. Yeah. All right, anybody have a question for any of the guys? <laughs> what are you what guys are you doing, doing tonight? tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Better put a time limit on that before I'll be, town. <laughs> I'll be around out town tonight. <laughs> Any question, guys? For real, don't be shy. To be honest, like it, now is actually a good time to ask a question if you have one. Even if it's the smallest one. Yeah, go ahead. How do you feel about going to Ottawa? Uh, Ottawa? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, obviously happy to meet my boy Thomas. I mean, I don't know if I'm happy about it. I can see his face every day. <laughs> no, but it's good, honestly. Um, you know, it was a big change for me, obviously. First time getting traded. I played, you know, my entire career here in St. John. I was drafted in Tampa, so I was there for, 
since I've been drafted too. So it was a big change for me. Um, obviously, excited to see where I'm going to live. I don't know where, where I'm going to live yet. Um, but you know, the, the, the city of Ottawa have welcomed me really well so far. Uh, felt at home, felt like I was here a little bit. Uh, you, you know, younger groups with uh, electric, really good, good players and, um, you know, exciting future. So very excited for, for, uh, for my time in Ottawa and uh, can't wait to spend more time with Chabby. Thank you. Any other questions for the guys? Uh, I just want to add uh, something. It's a beautiful Saturday. The sun is out tonight, but uh, I just want to let everyone in here, it means a lot to see uh, all you guys show up and uh, take the time to listen to the talk. And uh, obviously all you guys are trying to be better, are trying to do better for the community. So just want to say it means a lot. You know, we were talking about things you can do, you know, and things you can do to help or to, to, to show support and little things like this, obviously, you know, good long conversation about it and people have been really respectful about it. And, um, you know, like you said, it means a lot because of that, because it's little things that people do like this that makes us want to keep going, makes us want to be there for each other. And like you said, you can't do it by, we can't do it by, by ourselves. We need people with us. We need to be, you know, accountable to, with each other and, you know, showing up today is a great way for, for that. So thank you. Awesome. Hey, if, I can, if I can just add, I just wanted to, again, also say thanks to all of you. These conversations are really important. Being able to just be really forthright and direct on these conversations, it's not easy. But people that have the fortitude to do that are amazing. I also just want to say thank you to Trevor and, and uh, you, Mark, and the whole host committee. It went, what an incredible job. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, well, stick around. We've got another panel of alumni coming up in a moment. But guys, thank you so much. This is an important topic and appreciate you making time to share it with us. Thanks a lot, Dave. Thanks a lot.